My name is David Mason. I am a PhD candidate in the UF Deer Lab, and I'll be your TA for wildlife habitat management, which, as you will come to find out in the coming weeks, is heavily plant-focused. So today, we're going to learn about seed dispersal. All right, we're going to start off by sort of getting in the mind of a plant. Um, and it's really easy for everybody to uh, empathize or anthropomorphize uh, you know, animals, but Plants need to do the same things that all the other organisms need to do, right? They got to get resources, they need to avoid dying, and they need to reproduce. However, plants differ from animals uh, in one important constraint, and that is in movement. And plants are mostly sessile, or at least um, limited in how far they can, you know, expand out from any individual point where they've colonized, except for in the reproductive stages. Plants can move their sex cells, so pollen, in order to reach other individual plants to reproduce. And they can move their offspring, and propagules, which that's just a word for any vegetative structure that can become detached from a plant and give rise to a new plant. So plants can reproduce in a bunch of ways. Of course, what we're most familiar with is the production of seeds. So plants during an individual's lifetime are mostly immobile, um, but in between generations they can cover great distances. That makes these processes really important for plant population dynamics and the structure of ecological communities in general. Let's think about why plants would need to move pollen. Now, when plants first colonize land, some of our oldest land plants like mosses and ferns, they don't reproduce with pollen. Their sex cells, their sperm, just travel through water uh, to reach other individual plants. So they're sort of isolated to certain conditions when they can reproduce, and obviously there's a reduced distance that those sex cells can reasonably travel uh, in the water. Now why develop this adaptation? This it's basically a balloon to you know float sex cells from one individual to another, sometimes at great distances away. Well, some plant populations are sort of isolated and adapted to very you know, unique conditions, and they're well adapted and well suited for that. And in those cases, introducing new genes could actually sort of move them off their spot, move, move them from, from a, a, a genotype that is already really successful. But for most organisms and for most plants, uh, genetic diversity is a good thing. So pollen uh, allows plants to reach individuals that can be pretty far away and, and therefore probably distantly related to them. So pollen can, uh, the movement of pollen can increase genetic diversity. Why do plants need to move seeds? Well, let's think about these plants in, in the context of an ecological community. And let's think about what their offspring represent to other members of this community. A seed uh, is a food resource for other organisms. And most seeds don't move very far away from the parent plant. They have the ability to, but most don't. In other words, the closer you get to a parent plant, the more seeds you're going to find. And therefore, the more seed predators you're going to find, the more seed pathogens you're going to find. So moving away from a parent plant can increase seed survival. All right, so that situation I just described involves something called negative density dependent effects. In other words, the greater the density of offspring, the greater the negative effects from seed pathogens and seed predators. And as we just discussed, uh, that density was associated with the parent plant. In other words, the closer you are to the parent plant, the higher the risk of seed predators and seed pathogens. On the flip side, the farther away you get from the parent plant, or in other words, the farther you disperse, the lower your risk uh, from those causes of mortality. So one idea for why plants disperse seeds 
is called the escape hypothesis. In other words, plants disperse seeds to escape negative density dependent effects. Now, most seeds do not disperse very far away from the parent plant. In fact, that's the whole driving cause behind the negative density dependent effects, right? This is something called a dispersal kernel, and it's really just representing the probability of how far a seed will get any given distance. This is going to be different depending on the plant. But as you can see, most are going to disperse a very short distance from the parent plant. So most are not going to escape. The idea behind the escape hypothesis is just that enough seeds will get away from the parent plant via dispersal to escape these negative density dependent effects and have a chance at survival. All right, once that seed gets to wherever it is it's going, if the conditions are right, it may germinate. If not, the seed's going to sit there on the soil surface. If it doesn't get you know, carried away and, and eaten by another organism, in time, it may get buried in the soil. And many plants have evolved seed dormancy as a strategy of taking advantage of being in the soil seed bank um, until conditions become favorable. And these can be broken into two major categories, uh, depending on whether that dormancy is caused by something inside of the embryo itself, that's endogenous, or outside of the embryo, that's exogenous. So let's think about something like Vitus, uh, that's the, the genus that grape is in, and it's chemical seed dormancy. So that chemical dormancy it refers to having growth regulators that are present in the coverings outside of the embryo. They get washed, you know, they get leached away um, or deactivated by some means, and they stop suppressing growth, and eventually Vitus can germinate. Think about something like roost it has physical dormancy. That's an impermeable seed coat. It's preventing water from getting in there. Once that water gets in there, it'll germinate. Well, that'll get broken by you know, fluctuating temperatures, freeze-thaw cycles. Um, it can be broken by passing through the digestive tract of an animal. Uh, nicotania, that's uh, tobacco plants. Uh, that germination can be triggered by... Uh, has something called photo dormancy. So in other words, when it gets the right pattern of light, it will germinate. Um, similar to that in xanthium, when it gets the right temperature, it'll break dormancy. These are all strategies for the plant to sort of time when it wants to germinate because it wants to wait for the right conditions. So we have different types of seed dormancy and we also have different types of seed banks. In other words, plants differ in their strategy in terms of when they produce seeds, how long those seeds stay dormant, and when they're ready to germinate. So in this graph here, we have four different types of seed banks. And in the shaded parts of these distributions, the plant is ready to germinate. And in the unshaded parts, it is still dormant. Now, the point of looking at something like this is just to see that they are trying to capitalize on different parts of the year. We have our months on the bottom here, and I've broken them down into seasons. <clears throat> the idea is just to get that there are different types of seed banks, um, and that species are trying to take advantage of different openings uh, for a good chance to germinate. These are some species that we may see out uh, at tall timbers, potentially. There's also something called seedling banks, and seedling banks occur when slow-growing trees like uh, white oak or red maple or beech um, remain in a juvenile stage uh, for a long period of time until a, an adult individual uh, in a canopy is removed for one reason or another um, and then they are able to expand into that space. So rather than remaining in the soil seed bank uh, where they are, you know, uh, could be a target to seed predators, um, once once those plants start to germinate, once that something like, let's think about an oak. Once an acorn starts to germinate, um, it's no longer you know the valuable food item to the squirrel that it once was. Uh, so rather than remaining in that seed stage, we're going to germinate and then we're going to wait uh, as a seedling until uh, until our time comes. All right, so we started out talking about the escape hypothesis in which negative density dependent effects. Uh, associated with the parent plant. Remember, we said that most seeds do not get dispersed very far away from the parent plant. So as a result, 
there is more seeds by the parent plant and that aggregation of seeds plus the presence of the parent plant itself can increase seed predation and seed pathogens. Therefore, one of the reasons to disperse may just to be to escape those negative density dependent effects. That's the escape hypothesis. Another idea is the colonization hypothesis. We talked about you know, what happens when plants get away from the parent plant. Where do they land? And what happens when they, when they arrive? If this dispersal is random uh, in terms of the quality of sites where it ends up, uh, we call this the colonization hypothesis. So you know, plants may randomly arrive in a place and germinate. They may randomly arrive and not germinate, but enter the seed bank, as we discussed, or perhaps uh, enter the seedling bank, as we discussed, and wait in that random location until it becomes a good place to establish. Rather than this sort of random distribution of seeds uh, associated with the colonization hypothesis, this idea of just get a bunch of seeds out there, uh, some some might find a, a good place to, to land and germinate, or then maybe they'll wait there until it's a good place to germinate, you know, in the seed bank or in the seedling bank. Rather than that, some seeds may be directed towards favorable locations. And this pattern of dispersal, or rather this explanation for why dispersal occurs, is called the directed dispersal hypothesis. And dispersal associated with this hypothesis uh, it's going to be really impactful to plant fitness and plant community composition and structure because we're talking about seeds that get uh, directed towards a favorable location. So they have a, a greater probability of surviving um, and, and themselves reproducing. So just to recap, we discussed three hypotheses for why seeds disperse. The escape hypothesis and that plants are uh, avoiding negative density dependent effects associated with being close to the parent. The colonization hypothesis and the idea is that well plants disperse just to randomly try to find a, a decent place. You know plants can't uh, predict where the locations are so they just try to get the seeds out there and hope that some can establish or at least wait until conditions are better. And finally the directed dispersal hypothesis which is something that I study in my work and we're going to discuss a little later uh, and this idea is that you know, seeds are, are not randomly dispersed they're, they're directed towards favorable locations in many instances. Now a really important concept here we have these three sort of ideas to to think about and play around with when we're out there in the field looking at what's going on and trying to think like a plant. But it's not an either or or in this case I guess an either either or scenario all three of these hypotheses uh, may be confirmed by different dispersal patterns you see. So let's imagine we're seeing a tree and a sh or a shrub and it's got you know a hundred seeds that are dispersed around the parent plant. And the typical pattern that, that we discussed before where most seeds do not make it very far from the parent plant. Let's say insects kill you know 74 out of 75 seeds close to the parent plant. Let's say that bunch of weevils in the seeds and maybe rodents uh, you know get 15 out of 25 of seeds that got farther than 10 meters so you know we got the weevil close and then uh, and a rodent eating seeds that are got a little farther away well let's say that ants get to nine of the remaining seeds and eat eight of them and one of them they bring back to the nest and discard in a refuse pile so just as an aside, this ant dispersal is really important. Obviously, ants are everywhere, all over the world. Uh, they make up a ton of biomass. Um, and you know, people have found different numbers in different studies. But essentially, you know, when you're talking about uh, forest understory plants, ants will disperse many of them. This ant dispersal is called memricocori. It basically just means ant dispersal. Many plants have specialized adaptations to encourage uh, ants to disperse them. So what we're looking at here is uh, viola seeds. They have this, some, this thing called an oleosome, which is basically a fat body hanging around on the outside of the seed. The ants bring this seed back to the nest. They rip off the fat body uh, to feed on it, and that starts triggering the plant to be ready to germinate. 
and then the plant is the the seed which they don't want to eat they want to eat that fat body they deposit the seed in what's basically a, a an ant dump it's called the middens and that dump is full of a bunch of other refuse and it's high in nutrients and the plant does really well there so this is an example of directed dispersal this is a plant has this adaptation that encourages uh, its disperser to deposit it in favorable location for it to thrive at. All right, so of those 75 initial seeds we started with, we have two remaining. And let's say one is close to the parent plant and one is far away. Let's say you know a deer steps on one, a bear steps on the other. They enter the soil seed bank, they're dormant for a couple of years, and eventually they germinate. So in this example, for individual seeds, we saw dispersal that could support the escape, the colonization, or the directed dispersal hypothesis. And we had a seed that uh, entered the soil seed bank close and far away from the parent plant. Both of those remained dormant until they germinated, and we had one seed that survived and was dispersed by ants into nutrient-rich ant middens. And of those three, the one that's most likely to survive and reproduce and produce more offspring itself is the one that was directly dispersed in the ant middens. So we talked a lot about why seeds disperse. Now we're going to talk about how they do so. And we spent a little bit of time talking about memrichocori. And the end of that word means seed dispersal. The memrico part is talking about the ant. So ant seed dispersal. And we're going to see a slew of other uh, prefixes come before this cori word, um, this cori suffix. And there are going to be different words to describe dispersal. And a major way that you can distinguish different types of dispersal is between whether it is vectored or not. So is the plant using something other than itself for dispersal? So of the vector dispersal, over here in the self-dispersal, that would be non-vector dispersal. But of the vector dispersal, we have abiotic vectors and we have biotic vectors. And now we're going to go into these different categories in a little more depth. All right, so we'll go into a little more depth. Uh, we'll start by talking about self-dispersal here. Uh, and here on the left, we have geranium, also known as crane's bill. And it engages in ballo quarry. It's pretty incredible. The ballo, that should be mildly reminiscent of like ballistics or like a ballista. Uh, and that's because geranium can launch its seeds. So it's got the, a, a fruit um, that has these arms on it that's attached to a seed. And the arms are initially lodged uh, underneath another part of the plant. And as these arms dry up, as the fruit dries up, uh, the arm springs uh, loose and launches the seed several meters away move on to talking about something equally uh, as incredible, and that is herpicory in Avena, uh, also known as oats. So herps, uh, or herpetology, is a word to describe studying you know, reptiles and snakes and turtles. Uh, and that you know, Latin word means to crawl, and that's what Avena does. Uh, it can crawl along the ground. It's got these hairs on the outside of the seed that uh, uh, expand and contract with changes in moisture and humidity. It also includes dispersal via gravity. So this is just you know, fruit uh, with seeds inside you know, dropping off of a plant onto the ground. And even that you know, movement uh, from being attached to the plant to being on the ground is a form of dispersal. And it can also involve that fruit with its seeds then rolling away you know, if the plant is on a hill or, or what have you. Um, and that is also dispersal via gravity. So that's barrel quarry. And now we'll talk about uh, vectored or abiotic vector dispersal. So dispersal with wind and water as a vector. We have uh, fruit and seeds that are designed to float. So something like Ludwigia. Uh, these are native species we have that, that these fruit can float on the water. Something like uh, a coconut that's adapted for long distance travel on the oceans. You know, you've got these fruit just sort of bobbing around the ocean until the currents slap them into another island and they can they can colonize. And then we also have anema um, And this is wind dispersal. And 
This is any time a plant produces an adaptation to encourage flight. And those are typically either a wing structure, like we see here in this ash, or like in uh, maple samaras, or, uh, but it can also include things like uh, hairs, like you may see in like a dandelion, uh, you know, like the plant you blow on. Um, these are all ways to uh, remain in the air um, to encourage flight. And finally, we're going to talk about animal dispersal or biotic vectors. This includes epizoochory, so epi means outside, so this is outside of an animal dispersal. Um, these are seeds or fruit that have hooks and barbs to stick to an animal. We have bidens here, so this black here is a seed, and the yellow here hooks are how it uh, attaches to a vector. This is desmodium covered in this dog here. Um, a lot of times these, the common name for these plants has ticks somewhere uh, in the name. We also have endozoo quarry, so endo is inside, so inside zoo animal quarry, inside animal dispersal. And here our example is uh, black gum. And these are plants that have a, a fleshy uh, fruit to encourage either animals to consume and pass them through the gut or consume and regurgitate or at least eat the, eat the fruit and discard the seeds. All right, let's see if we can't reason for ourselves using some context clues how different plants disperse. So here we're looking at Taraxium. We have a seed, and then we have some sort of specialized adaptation on top. Now that specialized adaptation is called, uh, they're, they're called collectively Pappy, um, and they are used uh, almost like a parachute sort of to float through the air. So this is a dandelion here. All right, our next example, we have some seeds again. They're paired together up top here. Um, and then we have another set of specialized adaptations beneath. Those specialized adaptations look like wings or propellers. And again, we have a plant that is dispersed by the wind. This is a maple. All right, moving on, we have carambola here. And in the middle, we have three seeds. And those seeds are surrounded by some fleshy hairy carp on the outside, some fruit. Now, if a plant has fruit, it's probably trying to encourage uh, ingestion by animals, or at least handling by animals. So. This plant is dispersed by animals. All right, here we'll move on to our final example. This is a big juglin's nut, or walnut. Big nuts fall off of trees, uh, so that's a form of self-dispersal. We also know that nuts are cached by rodents, and the rodents will eat nuts and, you know, thereby predate the seed. Uh, but they'll also forget where they cast some seeds, and those are successfully dispersed. So juglins can be dispersed through self-dispersal or animal dispersal. And honestly, you can imagine scenarios where you know, water could also disperse uh, some of these nuts as well. So this illustrates you know, two important points. And one is that plants can be dispersed via multiple vectors, or I guess in the case of self-dispersal, you know, multiple pathways. And this is quite common. It also illustrates that you know, we can reason uh, how plants are dispersed just by looking at different adaptations that they have. Now, that's not always telling the whole story, but it gets us some part of the way. And because we can reason how it disperses, we can think about how the, this plant interacts with other members of the community and what kind of, uh, what kind of systems we may find in that plant. So a plant species can be dispersed via multiple pathways. You know, it can be dispersed without a vector. Uh, it can be dispersed by different vectors. But that's even true for an individual seed. Think about a, a seed that falls out of a tree. Oh, that's gravity dispersal. A flood comes and moves it. That's water dispersal. We talk about this secondary dispersal, or in other words, dispersal, uh, you know, another phase of dispersal that occurs after the initial movement from the point of origin. 
We talk about that a lot with uh, animal dispersed seeds. So think about uh, an animal consuming a fruit, defecating out the seeds, and then another organism coming and moving those seeds uh, after they've been defecated. So rodents do this, uh, ants do this, and of course dung beetles do this. Dung beetles are uh, a really special case because they are rolling up these balls of dung and laying eggs inside and burying those underground. In other words, if there's seeds inside of these uh, these balls of dung, they're being planted in the soil. And this is happening a lot. I mean, once you learn to look for it, I mean, dung beetles are everywhere and they are removing scat <laughs> many times as fast as it's deposited. All right, predators can also be involved in secondary seed dispersal by ingesting uh, animals that have ingested seeds. So we can think about that through two distinct pathways. A uh, predator could consume a seed disperser and then the predator itself will disperse those seeds. Uh, and a predator can also consume a seed predator. So these are organisms that uh, typically destroy seeds uh, when they consume them. Uh, you know, when the predator consumes the seed predator, when the predator consumes a seed predator, uh, it's now um, diverting those seeds that would have been consumed by the seed predator, and they are you know, potentially able to disperse. And the predator can consume the seed predator and now also ingest what other, whatever seeds were inside of the seed predator. And perhaps if some of those are managed to survive uh, being eaten by both these organisms, the predator can also disperse those seeds. So that is called diploendozoochore, double inside seed dispersal. Now predators can be involved in seed dispersal in numerous ways. You can think about predators, you know, affecting the behavior of different seed dispersers. Um, and then of course predators themselves, many predators uh, consume fruit species and disperse seeds. So I bring up predators dispersing seeds to illustrate uh, a theme of seed dispersal research, which this slide also uh, informs about. Seems the more we learn about seed dispersal, the more, the bigger role that animals take on in, in dispersing seeds. If you were to look into a seed dispersal database, many species will be listed as having no known adaptation for seed dispersal. Um, you know, they don't have any appendages for flight. They're not associated with a fleshy fruit for consumption. They don't have barbs to stick on the animals. So the assumption is just, you know, I guess these just disperse by falling off the plant. However, the more people actually go in and look at, at animal scat, the more they find seeds that are not associated with any known dispersal mechanism, but can still germinate in the scat. In other words, they can be dispersed by animals without having these specialized adaptations for, 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 for being dispersed by animals. This observation confirms a really important hypothesis called the foliage is the fruit. The idea here is rather than producing a fleshy fruit to encourage animals to ingest your seeds, uh, the foliage itself you know, attracts herbivores and encourages seeds to be consumed, and those seeds can be dispersed by animals. And if you think about seed dispersal through this lens, it widely expands the number of seeds that are dispersed by animals. This table here is just one of many publications uh, demonstrating going through SCAT. This, in this case, it's rabbit and sheep and finding different seeds that are, can be germinated from their SCAT. I think I've highlighted some species that could be found up at Tall Timbers, or at least in general in the region. So the more we expand the scope of plant and animal species that participate in animal seed dispersal, uh, the more important it becomes for us to know exactly how animal seed dispersal works. And we discussed three hypotheses for seed dispersal overall, as also including animal seed dispersal. Uh, and that was escape, colonization, and directed dispersal. And the directed dispersal is considered the rarest. It's supposed to only occur in highly specialized examples. Uh, for example, like the Mimrocori we discussed earlier with the Viola species that had a special fat body that encouraged an ant to bring it back to the colony and, and deposit it in the nutrient-rich middens. Another example is mistletoe, and it has a 
Now, mistletoe is this parasitic plant that grows in the canopy of trees. It produces a fruit that has a really sticky pulp inside. And animals, when they consume mistletoe, either, either on the way in or the way out, uh, it gets stuck to them and they try to dislodge it by rubbing it against a tree branch, which happens to be exactly where the mistletoe wants to colonize. It's supposed to be isolated to these uh, types of examples. A lot of the work that Dr. Lashley and I do and, and my dissertation is about is exploring directed dispersal in a much broader context. We think it occurs uh, much more broadly than is currently accepted. And we base our hypotheses on uh, a really important observation. That is just that uh, animals track resources. They spend, they dictate their time according to uh, uh, what resources are most valuable to them, and that should be where you would expect more seeds to be deposited, right? So in our example here, we have a foraging patch, a perch, and a nest, and these resources are of varying value to uh, the bird, and it spends, you know, dictates its time a lot according to the value, and then deposits seeds there. For directed dispersal to occur, you don't need specialized adaptations per se. All you need is for where the bird to spend most of its time to be a favorable site for plants to establish. Because resources are often associated with favorable places for plants to establish, uh, directed dispersal may be a lot more common than currently accepted. All right, so for my experiment, I'm focusing on uh, birds. You know, birds are important seed dispersers. They also have this uh, trap design that, that I've worked out um, where I have an artificial perch above a seed trap and then I am monitoring it with a camera trap directly across from the perch. So in other words, I can, I can keep track of what birds are visiting a recently burned area. You know, is it more than in a, a not recently burned area? Um, and I can measure uh, the seed rain that they're bringing in towards the burned area. So I would go in right after a burn and put in my seed trap and this is, uh, this is what that looks like. And we get a ton of birds at our seed traps. And as you'll see when you're up here at Tall Timbers, it's extremely diverse. We got a tanager here, blue grosbeak, indigo bunting, I think, a towhee, a bluebird, brown thrasher, shrikes. Red-winged blackbirds. We can also watch animals actually ingest the fruit. Right here with the bluebird. We can even watch birds defecate the seeds. So produce the data itself. Check that out. So then I will go out to the field and collect the seeds from the seed trap. This is me collecting seeds from a, a trap in a recently burned uh, plot. So then I would return to the lab with those seeds and separate the seeds into groups, uh, you know, separate them by species and count them up. And this constitutes the bulk of my data. Now, you remember, directed dispersal is non-random dispersal towards a favorable location. So what this experiment is trying to demonstrate is uh, our birds selectively visiting recently burned areas and our seeds being non-randomly dispersed towards recently burned areas. So by comparing bird activity and seed rain in recently burned uh, in one year rough, we can test the hypothesis of whether fire, this, this you know, widespread uh, global process is generating directed dispersal. Because if it is, then directed dispersal already, without all the other examples uh, that we showed in that table, is already way more common than previously accepted. All right, here's some preliminary data from this experiment out of Tall Timbers. Uh, these are the bird detections at the seed traps. I've grouped birds into dispersers and other birds, and dispersers are in blue, and other birds are in yellow. And here in the first figure, we're looking at mean total detections. And as we can see in the recently burned area, we get more dispersers than we have other birds. And in the one year rough, we have about equal detections of these two different types of birds. So fire is increasing the number of seed dispersers that we see. When we look over at the second figure, which is the total detections through the first couple months of the experiment, we see that these patterns look relatively similar. We have this peak here, 
So where is the difference that we see over in panel A coming from if those patterns look relatively similar? It's happening in the period of time immediately following the fire. Uh, we're going to talk about something in class called a magnet effect. Um, that is, there's a resource pulse associated with fire that uh, attracts wildlife species. And that magnet effect here is resulting in an increase in seed dispersers in the recently burned area. So that magnet effect on seed dispersers that we just saw in the previous slide, that happened in April and May. And that's because tall timbers burns in March and April. This timing is really important because plants flower and fruit at different times of the year. We get plants that produce fruit early in the growing season. We get the vast majority of plants that produce fruit later in the growing season during fall mi migration and when there's less insects around. And a, a subset of those species also produce fruit that persist uh, on the plant throughout the winter and into the following next year. As we saw in the previous slide, blackberry is a species that is fruiting during the early growing season, which is when the magnet effect occurred at tall timbers based on when they like to do their prescribed burns. So concurrent with that increase in dispersers in recently burned areas, we get an increase in seed rain, and that seed rain is blackberry because that's what's fruiting at the time. So in other words, the timing of fire is dictating which species of plants are arriving at the recently burned area. We can also compare the composition or the community of seeds arriving at each seed trap. So in other words, we're thinking about what arrives at a seed trap as a community of species. And we're going to compare seed traps in uh, recently burned areas and one-year rough area to see how much they differ. Um, the way you interpret this figure here, this is called an ordination here, is that each point represents a seed trap. And the closer the points are to one another, uh, the more similar those two seed traps are. And then you can also project the species that are associated with those communities onto the ordination as well. And sort of the closer a seed trap is to one of those species, which we have pokeweed, beautyberry, and blackberry here. These are common species at tall timbers. The closest, uh, a seed, a closer a seed trap is to one of those species, uh, the more that species is inside the seed trap. So we see that seed traps in recently burned areas were different from seed traps in one year rough. Um, this difference is largely driven by the presence of blackberry seeds. Now, this is preliminary data, and a lot of beautyberry and pokeweed seeds are not logged into the data yet. Um, I suspect that when they are, we are going to also see a similar pattern that we saw with blackberry, where we're going to see more of these seeds uh, in the recently burned areas. So I've described how directed dispersal may be occurring with fire. Um, but I'm really interested in this process broadly. And uh, as I said, some of my work is with carrion as a resource pulse rather than fire. Um, but the, the real general principle here is that resources uh, attract vectors and therefore attract seeds. And as sort of an initial demonstration of this principle, Dr. Lashley and I monitored seed rain beneath bird feeders. And it's pretty simple. The bird feeders attract birds, uh, and the birds are also feeding on you know, fruit species out in the landscape. And when they come to visit the feeder, they deposit the seeds there. And it's just a comparison of the number of seeds we caught you know, with a feeder, and then with control feeders, it, they weren't baited. They didn't have any food in them. So the reason I'm explaining this to you is that uh, we are going to sort of take this experiment uh, to the next level uh, over the course over the course of the course. Now, as I said earlier, all things being equal, you would expect the resource that was the most attractive to the seed disperser to attract the most seeds. But that all things being equal is two and a ton of heavy lifting, right? There's many factors that we could you know, think about that might modulate that process. And we're going to explore one of them, a, a really important one, and that is uh, the landscape of fear. How much does fear of predators impact the way that resources attract seed dispersers and therefore seeds? We're working on this project in collaboration with the, with the Sieving Lab, uh, and they study uh, titmouse communication. So titmouse... Uh, essentially broadcast 
uh, the presence of predators or the safety of any location. And many other species in the community listen into this broadcast. So we want to incorporate this landscape of fear uh, as described through titmouse communication into this general framework of resources attracting seeds and seed dispersers. In other words, how will uh, the perception of risk influence the way that resources um, attract seed dispersers and seed rain? So the Seeming Lab has isolated alarm calls and safety calls, and they use speakers to uh, play them throughout the day. So we would like to put those speakers with uh, our setup, you know, where we have uh, the bird feeder representing a resource, um, and either play the alarm call or the safety call, and then monitor seed rain beneath. So I'd like you to be thinking about that experiment, um, so that by the time we get to the course, you know, perhaps we can talk about some predictions or how we might want to design an experiment like that. Um, because we would like to run it during the course. If you have any questions um, about that or about anything I've discussed in this lecture related to seed dispersal, um, I'll be more than happy to, to talk about that with you. It's, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I uh, look forward to hearing from you. And if I don't, I will see you see in Tallahassee.